So today's agenda will be as follows. Um, we're going to hear from Deanna Apps, who will be giving us an update on the Great Lakes water levels. And we'll have two separate presentations after that covering flood management at the watershed level. The first from Kyle Magara from the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. And the second from Tara Solom and Elena Hansel, who will give us um, a talk about Lake Superior North, one watershed, one plan. And then lastly, Tori Graves and Bridget Brown have joined us today to talk about a new project from the Great Lakes and St. Louis Cities Initiative. Sorry about that. Uh, before we hear from today's speakers, I want to take a moment to introduce who I am, who is talking to you today, um, uh, and just kind of talk about how I'd like to engage with you all as CHAOS members this year. So as you know, Melanie Perello, the former CHAOS coordinator, her fellowship came to an end last year and it left the CHAOS coordinator duties open. So the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program and Wisconsin Sea Grant developed a Jay Keeler Fellow position for the new CHAOS coordinator. And I am that person. I am the, the Jay Keeler Fellow and Chaos Coordinator. So a little bit about who I am. I'm originally from Illinois. I received a bachelor's degree in psychology from Southern Illinois University Carbondale and a master's degree in human dimensions of natural resources from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Um, so I'm a social scientist. My passion is investigating human interactions and relationships with the environment and natural resources. And my background as a social scientist is, is relevant to you all, um, particularly when it comes to how I would like to engage with you all during my time here as chaos coordinator and with you as chaos members. So um, kind of one thing I wanna, I wanna just give you a little bit of information on is I, I see great value in reaching out to chaos members for your feedback on a few things regarding um, chaos, the evolving of chaos throughout this, this coming year. Um, and, and coming up with resources and, and information that would most benefit you all. So with that being said, um, we're kind of in the early stages of working on um, planning to conduct some qualitative interviews with chaos members. And there's a couple of things that we're interested in learning through these interviews that um, we're starting to plan. Specifically, one thing is that we've been using this term coordinated shoreline protection efforts as kind of a potential topic to be covered in future chaos events. And, um, you know, we want to recognize that that term might mean different things to different people. And when it comes to coming up with content that uh, to provide you in chaos events in the future, it's important important to kind of know what it does mean to all of you. And so that's one thing we're really interested in talking to you about. And we're also kind of a more broad issue that we're interested in is speaking to you, hearing your thoughts and perspectives regarding the future of chaos. So ideas, critiques, phrases, hopes that you have for the future of this community of practice, those are all things we're interested to know about. Um, ideas for topics, ideas for meeting formats, things of that nature. So I'm not looking for participants today. Um, I'm, I am simply reaching out and letting you know that this is something we're working on. We would like to conduct these interviews with chaos members and um, it's something in the works. You can anticipate us sending out a more formal invite at some point in the future. So that is what I have to say about that. And then here's my contact information. Email is probably the best way to reach me. Feel free to reach out to me anytime that you have any questions, concerns, or ideas. I would love to hear from you. And I'm really, really excited to be here. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna transition to our first speaker who, um, Deanna Apps. She's here to talk to us about the Great Lakes uh, water levels and I'm going to share her slides for her. Deanna, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. Let me pull up your slides and we'll get going. All right, sounds good. Oops. 
Okay, just give me a, let me know when they're up since I will be on the phone. Okay. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Can you see the slides? Yes, I can see them. Fantastic. So Deanna Apps is a physical scientist and lead forecaster for the Great Lakes water levels for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Detroit District. She received her master's degree from Michigan State University and her bachelor's degree from a Oswego State University in meteorology. She grew up in upstate New York and was a frequent visitor to Lake Ontario before moving to Michigan, where she was able to travel to the rest of the Great Lakes. All right, Deanna, I have your slides pulled up. You can take it away whenever you're ready. All right, well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and as it was mentioned today, I'll just be talking about some Great Lakes water levels, where we are now, and talk a little bit about the forecast product. So next slide, please. So I always like to start just by giving a brief overview of the Great Lakes Basin as a whole. So on this slide, you're seeing two images of, of the Great Lakes Basin. The one on the right showing more of an aerial view. Everything highlighted in green is considered the, the Great Lakes Basin covering eight, about 14,000 miles of shoreline. Of course, it's an international basin covering eight states and two provinces um, in Canada. So if you're looking at the diagram on the left, then this diagram I always put in here is just really to emphasize how water flows through the system. Uh, so water beginning in Lake Superior flows through St. Mary's River into Lakes Michigan and Lake Huron, through the St. Clair River into Lake St. Clair, uh, through the Detroit River into Lake Erie, through the Niagara River into Lake Ontario, and eventually uh, through the St. Lawrence River and out to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, Deanna, if you click one more time, we're having some trouble getting the slides to advance. So at least I'm not seeing them advance. Is anyone else? I'm not either, Adam. OK. You know, what slider are you presenting on right now? Two. OK. There we go. All right, sorry okay. to interrupt. Oh, no, that's OK. Sorry. Go ahead, Deanna. <laughs> The if you click one more time, there should be some red circles that appear on the slides as well. Um, and those two red circles represent two places in the system where outflows are regulated, uh, one being through the St. Mary's River that connects Lake Superior and Lakes Michigan and Huron, and then one um, out through the St. Lawrence River out of Lake Ontario. And regulation of these outflows is the responsibility of those respective boards of control. So there's an International Lake Superior Board of Control in an international Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board. Uh, and those are both operate under the authority of the International Joint Commission. Always like to stress, however, that regulation of outflows can't control water levels um, and can't prevent extreme or high, extreme high or low water levels. And water levels are primarily driven by uh, weather and hydrologic conditions. And that's something we'll talk about in this presentation. So on to slide number three. Uh, this graphic is representing where our water level gauging stations are throughout the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, all those dots shown in green are water level gauges that are operated on the Canadian side of the border by the Canadian Hydrographic Service. And all of the dots in blue are operated by NOAA or the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Um, if you, you might be able to notice that there are some larger dots on each of the lakes, and those are the water level gauges that we use when we calculate a daily lake-wide average water level. Okay, and each of those specific locations are listed at the bottom with the lake and those respective locations of where those water level gauges are. Um, we use, we try to use water level gauges that give us a full representation of what uh, the lake surface uh, of that water level is. So, if we go to the next slide, number four, uh, you'll see basically what is on our website. If you go to that link in the bottom left there, um, the, we provide these daily lake-wide average water levels on our website. Um, they are updated daily. This, these graphics are showing through the March 16th here. So that would be an example of the report. You can see here too, we do consider Michigan here on one lake because they are connected at the Straits of Mackinac. So, uh, you will see throughout the presentation, we reference Lake Michigan Huron as one lake. 
Um, so we report a daily lakewide average water level, and then you'll see like the mean here at the at the bottom uh, of that graphic on the left. Uh, and that's the monthly mean as of March 16th. But then as, once that month is complete, uh, we will have monthly mean water levels. And monthly mean water levels is one of the main water levels that we use as part of the six month forecast. And then also there's a graphic here on the right just showing you know, the daily water levels so far this year, where do they compare to last year, average and record highs and lows. Um, and also our six month forecast is on there, which I'll, I'll talk about later on in the presentation. So if we go to slide number five, um, I'm gonna transition here and talking more about what are the factors that impact water levels. So getting more at some of those weather and hydrologic conditions. Uh, so there's a few variables that we have to account for when we're talking about what are these factors that impact water levels. And the first two being, we have to account for the inflow from the upstream lake and the outflow out of that lake. So for example, Lake Michigan, Huron, we need to account for the inflow from the St. Mary's River, but we also have to account for the outflow out of the St. Clair River. So just given where it is in the system. But then the three main variables that are you know, weather related, hydrologically related to the system, we term that basin supply, and that's precipitation over the lake surface, runoff to the lake and evaporation off of the lake surface. So you can consider net basin supply to be precipitation plus runoff minus evaporation. And next slide, please. And then um, please just click one more time and then there should be a, a red line that stretches across the, this graphic of the hydrologic cycle and the different times of years. And this is really important to, to water levels in the Great Lakes because they do go through a seasonal cycle, uh, depending on the dominant uh, weather conditions that we're experiencing during the certain times of the year. So in the winter months, we typically see that seasonal low in water levels. Um, this is when you know snow is accumulating. Sometimes the ground could be frozen, you know, during during the winter months. But then as we head into the spring and that snow begins to melt, we have increased rainfall and runoff. Um, we start to see water levels begin to rise. So we're getting into this time of year where we're, we're coming to the end, where we're reaching a seasonal low and starting that rise uh, across much of the Great Lakes. When we get into the summer months, that's typically when we see the seasonal peak in water level. And during the summer, we see increased sunshine, which helps to warm the lake water. And that is really important because as we head into the fall months and we, and we start that water level decline, that decline is primarily driven by evaporation. And evaporation occurs when we have colder air, those cold air surges that start in the fall months, uh, moving over the relatively warm lake surface. And that really is what increases the evaporation and is a really, like I said, that driver of water level decline during those months. Um, next slide, please. So this is our full period of record of water levels that goes back to 1918. Um, the blue line that you're seeing on each of the hydrographs represents a monthly mean water level. So we have hydrographs here for each of the lakes, um, stretching from Lake Superior's at the top, all the way down to Lake Ontario at the bottom. The red line that stretches across each of the graphics it's a long-term average annual level. So if you're just looking at the blue line, you know, across, you know, you do have meters axis on the left, a uh, feet axis on the right. And then of course the Y, the X axis, excuse me, is stretching from 1918 through February, 2022. We can clearly identify periods of high and low water. And if you click, uh, Click twice, there should be uh, now red, a red shaded area and a green shaded area. And the red shaded area is representing a, representing a decade plus of low water with some record lows on Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron. And then that green shaded area representing the beginning of the rise uh, that we've, you know, that we've seen basically an upward trajectory to those record highs of 2019 and 2020. And you can see since the record highs of 2019 and 2020, we've seen uh, some reprieve there in water levels as, as, they, as water levels have retreated uh, slightly over the last year or two. Uh, 
Next slide, please. It should uh, be slide eight. And uh, this is, I'm just going to take a couple slides just to go over some recent basin conditions. Uh, so this graphic that you're seeing is um, difference from average precipitation for each of the uh, each of the lake basins stretching back uh, five years. So the graph stretches, the x-axis goes from March 2017 to February 2022. Uh, the blue bars are indicating precipitation above average. The red bars are, are would indicate precipitation below average. Now, if we look back all the way to the left side of the graphic, starting in, in that March of 2017, um, you can see uh, really across all of the Great Lakes, we're seeing predominantly blue bars, which are indicating of that above average precipitation. Um, and you can really see probably, I'd say at least into 2019, you see predominantly blue bars, especially some, some that go actually pretty high. But when you start getting into 2020, you can see that, that that trajectory really started to change and you're starting to see more red bars, especially during um, the fall, winter, and early spring of 2020 into 2021. Um, that was you know, a really dry period that we saw across the Great Lakes Basin. If you look at the top two, the top two uh, graphics are Superior and Lake Michigan Huron. You can see really over the recent time they've experienced some drier conditions than we've seen in the in the eastern portions of the basin like on Erie and Ontario which did have a rather wet summer and fall of 21. Uh, so just giving you an idea of kind of how conditions have been recently um, compared to those you know really wet years that we had and that contributed to the high water. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, should be one more slide here on just some recent basic conditions. I know, uh, you know, usually we talk about ice cover uh, when it comes to water levels every now and then. And because we're getting to that time of year where, you know, the water, the ice cover is declining. Um, but we did see a maximum this winter of about 56% on February 26th, which is just slightly above the long term average of about 53% for the, for the uh, total Great Lakes ice cover. And then here on the right, I just wanted to give an idea of temperatures and how they've been throughout the basin recently. Uh, this is a departure of, from normal temperature over the last 60 days. So stretching from January to March 27, or March 17th, uh, 2022. And you can really see around the Lake Superior Basin, you're seeing some purples and blue colors, which are indicating temperatures about six to eight degrees Fahrenheit below normal uh, over the last 60 days. Um, and you can see really across the entire Great Lakes Basin about even maybe two to four degrees Fahrenheit um, below normal. So just, just give it an idea there. That was a really big factor this year, especially in January and February when we saw those really cold months. We did see a lot of evaporation off of the lakes um, during that time due to those cold air, you know, moving over the, the relatively warm lake surface. All right, and just now we should be, if you go to the next slide, we'll be moving into the forecast. Um, so I'm going to show the forecast here for both Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron for the next six months. We create these forecasts at the beginning of every month and they stretch out six months, so March to August. Um, just to, if you're not familiar with these graphics, I'll give a brief overview. Uh, these graphics are based off of zero line chart datum, 601.1 feet. And then each line from that zero is about two inches. So if you, you know, added it up, you would eventually, if you're using the feed axis on the left, you'd get to like plus one foot and plus two feet if you're, if you're following those lines. The blue dash line represents the long-term average monthly mean water levels. Um, those dashes at the top and bottom with the year above it, that represents the record high and low monthly mean water level. Uh, with the associated year. And then the red line is the observed monthly mean water level. So you can see, if you follow that red line across, you can see that about in August or September of last year, uh, Lake Superior's water levels uh, fell below average and they've been below average ever since. Um, and if you follow that line into March of 22, then that's when you'll see our forecast. And that green dash line is what we consider the most probable. Um, and then the red bars extending from that are the 90% probability range of water levels 
Um, so if we see wetter conditions, it could be toward the top of that band. If we see drier conditions, it could be toward the lower part of that band. Uh, and if you're looking at the most probable, you can see we still are forecasting water levels on Lake Superior to, to be below, below average over the next six months. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is, should be a similar graphic here for uh, Lakes Michigan and Huron. Uh, you can see I've pointed, put some purple arrows here to, to point out the, the record highs from 2020. Um, but you can really see since the record highs of 2020, especially on Lakes Michigan and Huron, you can really see water levels have, have dropped significantly. Um, actually the January 2021 monthly mean uh, was the highest in that calendar year. So, if, you know, from January to December 2021, the January 2021 level uh, was the highest, which is a very rare occurrence um, in our period of record. Uh, and from where we are now, you know, the February 2022 level was 18 inches below the February 21 level. So we have dropped off significantly, but you can still see with the forecast, if you're following that green dash line, uh, we do forecast water levels to remain uh, above average, about six to nine inches uh, over the next six months. Next slide, please. Uh, and then one of the last things um, I wanted to touch on here was our water level future scenarios product. Um, we've had this product for a few years now, um, and it helps us to answer the questions, what if? You know, it allows us to have more of a scenario-based tool. Um, so this is not a forecast. Um, it's really, as I mentioned, a scenario-based tool based on historical water supply data. Uh, so we have water supply data that goes back to 1900. And what this tool is essentially saying is if we are starting at this current water level and we run all of our net basin supply sequences back to 1900 through our regulation and routing model, this would be the range of water levels that we would see. And if you're looking at the graphic, that's what's represented by this gray shaded area. Uh, so that black solid line is the observed monthly mean. And then you'll see once you, you know, follow that long enough, you'll reach the scenarios. Um, so again, that gray shaded area represents the full range. And then every three months, uh, we, we develop a new scenario. So actually a new scenario is coming out in April. Um, this current scenario is based off back-to-back -back La Nina years. Uh, so that's what's represented by this purple plume. Um, and then we've called out three years within the plume um, and those years are noted below. So the green line's 85, 86, the blue line's 2000, 2001, and the yellow line is 2018, 19. So it looks out a full year. So this goes to February, 2023. Um, and just shows you basically a range of possibilities based on historical water supply data and a current condition. So this, for this example, the what if was what if, you know, what could occur with back-to-back -back La Nina years? What have we seen in the past, essentially? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the last slide is just showing some key points, um, all of which we touched on about water levels being primarily driven by weather and hydrologic conditions about how regulation cannot prevent extreme high or low uh, water levels. Um, water levels, as we mentioned, are below last year's levels on Lake Superior and Michigan Huron. And a resilience to a wide range of water levels remains important because we can have changing weather and hydrologic conditions that can happen quickly um, and can be persistent over years or multiple years. And the next slide will be my last slide. And it's just really providing some links to information um, and some contact information. Um, my supervisor, Keith Kompalsowitz, and his phone and email, as well as my uh, phone and email as well. So um, thank you everybody for the opportunity to present. Sorry that um, I'm only on the phone, but I'm glad I was able to, to, to present it. Thanks for moving my slides along. Deanna, I think you did a great job. We can hear you loud and clear, and I think I think it translated just fine. So, really, really appreciative of you joining us here today, and I know everybody really appreciated to hear your updates that you gave. You did a great job. Um, unfortunately, we kind of need to move on to our next presenter just to respect everybody's time. Deanna, are you okay um, if people have any questions, if they reach out to you?
given the email that you provided on your slides? Yes, absolutely. Please feel free to email me. Happy to answer any questions for sure. Okay, perfect. So if anybody has any questions for Deanna, I encourage you um, to to contact her via her email. We'll put that, make sure that's in the chat if it isn't already. And um, just to be respectful of everyone's time, I am going to move things along and introduce our next speaker, um, who is Kyle McGarra. And Kyle McGarra is a local government outreach specialist for the Wisconsin Wetlands Association, where he coordinates their natural flood management programming and develops tools, resources, and trainings to help communities improve consideration of wetlands and land use policy, hazard mitigation, and watershed planning and management. Kyle is going to share updates on an ongoing natural flood management assessment and demonstration project. So Kyle, I see your slides are already up. They look great. You can take it away. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Kyle McGarrett and I'm the local government outreach specialist and I'm going to be talking about natural flood management today. I'm going to flip off video just because I've had some bandwidth issues as well, um, but I'll kind of get it going from there. So. Uh, this work is uh, is reflective of a collaboration that was formed with Ashland County and um, the assessment and demonstration has taken place in the Marengo River watershed, which straddles uh, primarily Ashland County and, and parts of Bayfield County on, along the south shore of the Lake Superior Basin in um, Wisconsin. And this this is a picture from the Marengo River and uh, uh, is a uh, visualizing the extensive damage that um, is still present since the 2016 flood. Uh, many inland watersheds, um, every bend has unstable bluffs that are sending you know, massive amounts of, of sediment and debris and nutrients into the system, which is creating it uh, more expensive and complex problems along the coastline. So natural flood management really emphasizes working in, in the upper watersheds and trying to slow the flow and uh, providing a management option uh, to address fluvial processes or riverine systems uh, to build resilience. Um, all this work is being, is being um, driven by, um, uh, uh, is being funded by a FEMA advanced assistance project that was awarded to Ashland County. Um, and is uh, intending to expand the concept of natural flood management. Uh, natural flood management is the our spin on what you, you're hearing nationally in terms of nature-based solutions, engineering with nature, um, and is a concept of uh, mitigating erosion hazards and rebuilding the, the landscape's natural capacity to store and manage water. Um, it, it is really a, a, also a spin on uh, trying to restore hydrologic processes um, as, a, as a risk reduction strategy and reconnecting channels, floodplains, and wetlands to provide roughness, storage, connectivity, and infiltration. As, as mentioned up top, uh, this work is taking place in the Marengo River watershed. Um, the, this is uh, some initial mapping that's been done with the, the Great Lakes Road Stream Crossing Inventory Method. Uh, one of the first times where uh, a watershed wide uh, culvert inventory was created uh, using some of the uh, metrics within that methodology. Um, one advantage of the Great Lakes uh, Inventory Method is it produces a flood resiliency scores. So when uh, combined and taking and digitizing uh, disaster uh, declaration data from FEMA and Wisconsin Emergency Management, we can get a sense of where, where the problem areas are and, uh, and, and investigating further to, to know what's going on upstream. Is there problems um, that are associated with degraded hydrology, the flashy landscape? Um, and uh, trying to take uh, identify opportunities to uh, not only replace uh, uh, road stream crossings, but to combine it with the up the uh, upstream hydrologic restoration component. Um, it, as you saw on screen in the in the cover photo, um, an, an overlooked piece with the the growing frequency of these large storm events is that our natural infrastructure is also taking a toll. Uh, our our uh, hard infrastructure is, is vulnerable and, and uh, degrading over time, but our wetlands and floodplains have become disconnected and are no longer able to provide the functions that they once did. 
So the, through the FEMA Advanced Assistance Project, uh, we're developing methods and data that can be used in FEMA's Benefit Cost Analysis Toolkit um, and other uh, funding applications uh, to, to implement or incorporate the nature-based approach into uh, uh, hazard mitigation efforts. This is also, uh, this work is already uh, representative of a, a longer time frame, and uh, it originates from uh, initial support from the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program. This is a ripple effects mapping effort that we did uh, last year to identify all the ways, um, the different types of activities that have happened because of um, the, the technical assistance and some of the outreach support that was provided to Ashland County. Um, I'm going to be mostly talking about um, the, the kind of middle portions of this graph, but um, the, the really the launch of the, um, the natural flood management initiative was because of a release of a case study that documented um, some of the observations after the 2016 storm. And all of that has grown into a much larger initiative uh, that's starting to, uh, to um, uh, materialize in on the ground action and a larger demonstration project in the, in the heart of the Marengo River watershed. Most of the assessment, or all, all of the assessment is, um, uh, is being founded on how, how to help communities compete for both FEMA public assistance money, uh, so the money that's available after a disaster declaration, as well as uh, the different forms of pre and post um, hazard mitigation. Uh, FEMA has a high bar for documentation, and, uh, and it's typically after a, a disaster is looking for compliance uh, with their public assistance program, but also is, is uh, expecting it from uh, benefit cost analysis, um, preliminary engineering and design, and other requirements, um, which we're all trying to tackle and, and prepare in advance. So Ashland County and the towns are prepared for uh, if another flood hits, and can also be able to document uh, the opportunities to include hydrologic restoration in part of their response. We're also including um, typically when in thinking about floods, uh, the common focus is on inundation. Uh, so there's a lot of flood inundation mapping. Our, our regulatory floodplains are founded upon that 1% annual exceedance prob probability storm. But there's other uh, mechanisms of failure um, that can really uh, contribute to the, the washouts that we're seeing, especially in rural areas. Um, so the different erosion and deposition processes in, in, in various parts of the watershed can have cascading responses, and those can be all accelerated by uh, uh, climate-induced uh, changes in uh, rainfall intensity and flooding. And so because we're trying to help the, the county identify upstream solutions to some of the downstream problems, we're really focusing on, on the, the erosion processes that are occurring in the headwaters um, and undermining the ability to slow the flow and provide that storage upstream of at-risk infrastructure. Uh, fluvial erosion hazards uh, specifically refers to terminology uh, that FEMA recognizes. Um, uh, New England states such as Vermont uh, developed um, FEH corridors, um, basically to identify the meander belt along, along the main stem of large rivers. In the Marengo, we're, we're taking or expanding on those existing fluvial erosion hazard methodologies and, and trying to identify where small erosional features such as gullies, channel incision, and head cuts are contributing to the loss of storage and floodplain disconnection. So here's an example of a, a, a a headwater wetland complex along a first order stream uh, with a headward erosion or a drainage network extension uh, forming a large channel um, that's uh, diminishing this wetland's ability to store water. Uh, floodplain disconnection is another uh, focal uh, stressor. Uh, so looking at where um, incised meadows and ravines um, are, are worsening and where basically where channels are, are currently located where they should not be. So in this ravine system, this should be a, a, you know, full of a, a dense uh, sedge wet meadow. Um, but instead, uh, because of the, the excess water and sediment that uh, is moving through this system, there's a, a, that channel is, is um, deepening and widening and forming, uh, causing flow to be channelized and not to spread out onto this uh, riparian corridor or the, the hydrologic floodplain. 
And taking uh, and trying to pair the assessment with the Great Lakes Roadstream Crossing Inventory and, and modeling it off of uh, existing FEH approaches, um, here's an example of a screening tool uh, that was developed to, to help in Vermont to, to look at different factors and to assign risk levels based, based on uh, certain landscape features. We're uh, building off of this, so um, these are not all the risk factors that are under consideration. Um, but we are using this format to, to include things like headwater sensitivity, the amount of ditches, ravines, um, and so on, and other factors that, that uh, can really uh, increase flow velocities uh, upstream of infrastructure. Uh, some of the core data that we're using, I, I mentioned the, the, road, the Great Lakes methodology and the um, uh, repetitive loss information. But I do want to call out that uh, the, the stream network has been broken into 60 meter segments to help with some of the data attribution and we're uh, applying um, uh, the new tools from uh, Geomorphon and height above nearest drainage or hand and I'll uh, give uh, some visuals of that here in a second. But uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about uh, the potential for mass wasting, uh, so bluff failures or extensive gullying, you can see the 60 meter segments that have been rated by the their average slope or stream gradient and in, in the uh, Marengo um, we're specifically worried about the um, the intersection of the of the parent material or the soil transition zone where there's a layering of clay and sand uh, that uh, creates uh, situations of groundwater piping and sapping and that's highly correlated with uh, bluff failures where you have that sand blends that's more likely to fail um, so being able to identify the portions of the stream network that are in this area can help can help elevate the, the risk um, uh, within the stream network. We're also looking, I know there's a lot on this map, but we're looking at um, the headwater sensitivity. Um, so a hand is again that height above nearest drainage and that's uh, mapping areas. Um, there's different thresholds that you can set. Um, and this is a one meter or less category. So it's showing the area above the channel, that flat area above the channel, that's more like most, or there's gonna be a, a higher likelihood of soil and water interactions or uh, more potential for overbank flows and deposition. So they can help identify um, the valleys, valley bottoms that are prone uh, to be wet or where there's potential for reconnection. Uh, PRWs are the potentially restorable wetlands. And then the red is the steep, the, the ravines and steep valleys uh, module that, that was developed. By overlaying all these, we can start to identify a natural infrastructure that, that's at risk. And the aerial is pointing to one example that's been identified. So this is looking upstream. Um, the channel conditions, uh, again, this is a, a, a setting where there should not be a channel uh, of that configuration. Um, that ravine is starting to deepen um, and becomes much steeper and is acting as a, um, an, a, it's working its way into this wetland complex that's mapped as potentially restorable wetland. So by being able to identify these areas uh, can help from both a uh, from the risk assessment uh, side of things, identifying areas that are prone to head cutting and that drainage network extension. But also if you can intervene in this gully cycle um, in advance uh, before it becomes a much, a much larger uh, ravine or the problems become too costly, it can help uh, identify where there's cost effective opportunities. Uh, in moving to the a demonstration, um, that's, that's probably it's a, an entirely presentation in, in its own right, um, but this is an example of how the data can come together and identify areas. This site was identified um, based on uh, input from the local agricultural community and, and the data has been since developed but it's proven to be a good way to validate uh, some of the assessment information. So in uh, that ravine area in the red you can see the incised meadow um, that's uh, where this is an area where they will we'll use woody debris as a restoration agent, um, low-tech process-based restoration approaches. And the purple and the teal is the, the valley bottoms that were identified through geo, the geomorphon tool. So the, the teal kind of color is identifying the, the foot slopes or where there's that topographic break. And you can see it along the edges of that, that height above um, nearest drainage or where there's uh, you know, more potential to spread out water. There is gulling in this system and the road is acting as a barrier, um, but we, we cannot see that it, 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 with the PRWs, it is identifying areas that are degraded and where there's opportunities for hydrologic restoration. 
And thinking about um, there's uh, through this, the, the demonstration project, we've developed a, a catchment scale um, a menu of tactics that uh, follows the, the NIACs or the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, their adaptation menus. And the, this image shows the different types of practices that are um, being designed um, to one, uh, prevent uh, uh, crop uh, failure on, in this farm, at this farm site, but also to get the flows across the road into a wetland that's been disconnected and is starting to dewater and not have the same hydrologic processes as it historically might have. So looking at the different areas along this tributary, the goal is to regenerate the stream wetland corridor and uh, rebuild self-sustaining um, hydrologic processes. So I'm thinking about the, the benefits. Um, all this work is transitioning into a collaboration with the Association of State Floodplain Managers and, and many other partners um, that are gonna be helping to take the assessment uh, to the next level and, and do an engineer level flood modeling, functional assessment, cost benefit analysis, and other activities that will hopefully help elevate uh, natural flood management as a risk reduction strategy um, within FEMA and perhaps even DOT uh, funding streams. But the, in, by investing in, in natural flood management, you know, that it can help increase, uh, open up different partnerships and the technical support available. Um, there's definitely this approach, um, combining it with other uh, data sources is helping to improve the availability of data. Uh, but most importantly, it's helping communities um, uh, be ready and compete for those pre and post disaster aids. Um, you know, even though this this work is focused on flooding um, by restoring uh, wetland and floodplain function, you're going to gain the water quality benefits. So the nutrient and sediment load reductions, the fish and wildlife habitat. So um, uh, natural flood management can also have uh, be used as a strategy for dealing with other land and water management problems. With that, um, thank you so much for your time. And I, I can take, if there's time, I can take uh, any questions. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. If any of the audience members um, have any of those for Kyle. Karina, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead and ask a question. Hi, thanks. Hey, Kyle, it's Karina. Um, I thank you for your presentation and you had a lot of great imagery in there. And I just noting like one thing that wasn't in the pictures were like a lot of Lake Superior coastal areas, but I was hoping you could, you know, from a landscape perspective, maybe help um, our, you know, our coastally minded group of folks here, what the connection might be between you know, this upstream up watershed work, um, natural flood management work and downstream, maybe more coastal connections. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. So uh, partly by that was intentional, but the, um, you know, the, the Marengo is in the, is a sub watershed of the, the Bad River watershed, which is documented as one of the largest sediment sources to, to Lake Superior. And the Marengo is, is right in the heart of the, the agricultural belt um, of Ashland County. And it unfortunately sits right on top of that, that transition zone. Um, so by, by dealing with things as, as far up in the, um, the watershed and, and basically turning off the valve, slowing the, slowing the flow and turning off the valve of those, those sediment sources, um, it can help um, you know, alleviate some of the problems um, before they become um, you know, too, uh, I guess before it's too late and you're reacting to that problem along the coastline. That's not to say that to diminish the value of, of doing that work along, along the coastline, but by investing in the upper watershed, um, it can help. Um, it just opens up additional opportunities and, and can help um, rebuild the, the watershed and uh, health and resilience that, that's important um, to uh, dealing with some of the issues along the coastline. Thank you for that, Kyle. We have about one more minute. If anybody else has a question, feel free to, to speak up or, or type in the chat. Miles, I see you have a question. You can go ahead and, and ask it when you're ready. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to use the, the hands and everything. Um, no, Kyle, I really appreciate 
your your presentation and I do have a follow-up on Karina's question that I was hesitant to ask because I don't want to be too much of a stinker um, but a lot of my work has to do with coastal erosion on on Lake Michigan's coast but I look a little bit at Lake Superior as well and my, my question for you was on that that process of slowing the flow of sediment into the the lake from the Bad River watershed would you foresee or see the need for any amount of balancing and still allowing some sediment flow into the lake? I don't know if that question makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually a great point. Um, and I, I should have been clear about that. You know, uh, sediment and debris transport is a natural process. And I, I, what I, with, you know, changing land use and, and climatic conditions, we've tipped the scales. So, um, you know, there's uh, an imbalance and so higher, sediment that's moving through the system but you know you know wetlands um they need that sediment and and debris to get the habitat complexity so it's not necessarily like uh you know you're never gonna arrest erosion and deposition completely but um how do you reconnect areas in a way that's gonna um rebuild those natural processes that are important to the the resilience of the system so um, I, yeah, the, that's where the assessment information can help you identify, um, and road stream crossings are typically acting as a barrier uh, to sediment, so that, that one demonstration site, um, the, the channel is completely filling in, and it's causing flows to go and uh, cut through an, an entirely different catchment, um, so by understanding where you have those undersized crossings, that, that can also give you an indication where there may be that altered uh, sediment transport as well. Yeah, that helps clarify it a lot. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Kyle. And thank you, Miles, for your question. I'm going to keep things rolling here. Right, uh, we're you. going to move on to our next presentation. Um, it's going to be on one watershed, one plan. Um, so I'll I'll um, introduce our two speakers for this section. Tara Solom is the Lake County Water Planner and District Manager at Lake County Soil and Water Conservation District. She's been with the district for two years and has previous experience with watershed planning while at the MPCA. Tara enjoys the collaboration with partners and assisting landowners with important on the ground projects. And also presenting with Tara today is Elena Hansel. Um, Elena is the Cook County Water Planner and District Manager at Cook County Soil and Water Conservation District. She's been with the district over 10 years she was part of the pilot program for the One Watershed, One Plan in the state of Minnesota. And Elena enjoys working with landowners and partners on conservation projects. So Elena and Tara, uh, whenever you are ready to share your slides and continue, we are ready to hear from you today. Good afternoon. I am just waiting for it to load here. Sorry, just a second. And I'm going to turn my screen off. Um, my name is Elena Hansel, and I am happy to be here. And of course, it's not going. All right. <laughs> we even practiced this, Sarah. <laughs> if you need, if you need assistance, I there can pull up your slides on my end. There you All go. Right. That's great. Take Excellent. it away. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm just going to do a brief overview of what the One Watershed, One Plan and kind of how it relates to coastal erosion. And then Tara will take up the second part um, and just talk about how we've worked with partnerships and how we work together on coastal erosion across political boundaries and with landowners. So just a quick, um, I know we're short on time, so I'm going to let you mentally think about this and not have to put it in the chat. but. If you were to have a landowner call you and say, hey, I want to know what's going on. Um, I have a question. I'm concerned about coastal erosion. If you were to think mentally, which one of these would you really, really want to go to? So I'm sorry, just a second. So um, I have been to all of these sites and they're all equally challenging. Um, the first one has as a historical site that it's, you know, has this old um, 
wall there and it's into the bedrock and then it's got this eroding area and that's a hard one because above it is a house right up here and so what do we it's an old one you know back from the original times when this area was settled so what do you tell the landowner you don't want to remove the trees because that might cause more issues what are they going to do and so that and causes more issues and questions sometimes than it does answers. Um, this landowner decided to hard armor with giant three foot boulders. And then we've worked with the landowner to do vegetation management up there. We don't encourage that, but that's what they chose to do. Um, this one here is a gigantic bluff on a peninsula with a river up towards the top of the picture that comes out. And there's no, as you can see, there's no vegetation there. So again, what do we tell the landowner? So, you know, it's, it's there, um, again, this is a historical area where there was a huge area or old structure where they used to take up water. And so just a lot of questions and, and comments and concerns and often leave with like, I don't know if I told the landowner the right thing, but that's, that's what we have there. Number three, this is when we came up to with a contractor and the landowner has no vegetation on the top. So everything's literally just now spilling over the wall. So that's a whole nother get to discussion that you get to have. And number four, believe it or not, someone called and said they were so concerned about the erosion and it looks so beautiful. So now you have to convince a landowner that there are no issues. So these are things that we face on the North Shore and these are all different types of landowner scenarios. So um, just a brief introduction if you're not familiar with the North Shore of Lake Superior. So previously water planning used to be done at a local level with boundaries. Um, Lake County had their plan, Cook County had their plan. We would have to find projects, apply for funding. Hopefully we could get it, a ton of grants. We still work off a ton of grants, but just a lot more grants very limited resources, very limited information for targeting our work, and then very limited collaboration. So it just, this is across the state of Minnesota, how water planning and resource work went. Cook County and Lake County decided to partner up and become partners and apply for the One Watershed One Plan. So there's our boundary. It's um, a little tiny bit of uh, St. Louis County, but mostly L Lake and Cook counties are involved in this. So what are the resources up here that's not familiar? We have really high quality natural resources in the state, some of the highest. We've got pristine to exceptional waters and rivers, um, predominantly heavy clay soils, which are really susceptible to erosion. Our rivers are different. They're, I like to say they're backwards. We're up at the top is where we have that nice fluvial area, that nice flat area on the top. And then we have the rush down to Lake Superior, where a lot of places you have it, the um, rush up top and then it fans out at the bottom. We don't get that pleasure. Um, we have a lot of private land and developments focused on our Lake Superior and our inland lakes and streams and rivers. And then one of our biggest factors besides sediment is also um, septic system waste um, because we don't, the only municipality we have for wastewater is, is just through municipalities. Otherwise it's septic systems. So we joined up and did the One Water Shoe One Plan across political boundaries that involves both the counties and the conservation districts. It was a couple year process. The benefits of doing it, we had better, we had now have better collaboration and understanding with larger landowners in the watershed. Um, we have the ability to target and prioritize conservation work a lot better and easier. Um, and we'll demonstrate that in a minute better understanding of what we don't know in the watershed, which turns out there's a lot, and that's okay. That means we always get to be learning. Um, an opportunity to expand resources management beyond political boundaries. So, you know, an example would be, I had a commissioner from Lake County ask me for information on the watershed. You know, I don't think that would have happened in the past. So it's pretty cool to, to be able to cross those, those boundaries. And then just more of a systematic conservation planning effort. So we're not putting band-aids on everything. So we did um, through this, just because I know we're short on time and I could talk and talk, we're going to just look at this and this plan is prioritized by tier. So tier one is the priority. And if you see on number three, near Shore Lake Superior, that's, these aren't in a particular order as to what's worse. It's just, that's the tier one. And we had seven um, that flushed out throughout our process of the plan. But near Shore Lake Superior was an area to really focus our work on for both protection and for restoration strategies. So with this plan development and adoption by the counties and the conservation district, there is funding, which is really exciting because we can now do some of the projects within the plan. So the funding is provided through the Board of Water and Soil Resources. It's a biannual process. Um, the funding provides partners, who it's provided to the partners who have adopted the plan. But if you're a partner outside of the plan and say you, you um, are, 
a municipality, you could work with the conservation district or the county, or you could directly apply for some of that funding to get some work done, as long as it's tied to the plan and benefits the resources. So in 2018, everybody wants to know, well, how much money did you get? Um, you can see what we got for 2018, 2022, and then 2020. And 2022 and 2020 equal each other out. Um, 2022 is a unique year. Um, again, highlighting some of the benefits of this plan where the county actually took some of that funding on and did some septic system work. They're still working on it. These are three-year cycles, but it's exciting to see them stepping up and utilizing this process and this, this funding to help with the resources. So with that, because I know I, I spoke quickly, but I can answer a lot of questions. I just didn't want to hog Tara's time up and, and all the good stuff she has to share. I'm going to pass this over to Tara and she can talk about partnerships and some of the advantages that we had with um, our current work and some of it has developed from the One Watershed, One Plan. Yeah, as Elena mentioned, we had some really great partnerships developed through this process and they continue developing. Um, there's many entities in Minnesota and organizations that work on coastal shoreline topics and efforts. Um, so just getting everyone at the table and being able to divvy out what do you guys do, what's your process, how does things work, and how can, um, you know, education outreach or assistance or some of those other things fit into the picture. Um, the county offices have water um, permits and so people who want to do work along the shore need to contact the county as well as DNR um, hydrologist permitting and water permitting through the, the DNR as well. And so how does our offices, um, Elena and I work with soil water conservation districts and we're not regulatory, we're here for assistance for landowners. Um, and we also collaborate with other agencies. And so being non-regulatory, we wanna be approachable and we also want to assist with how those permits work and what we can do to make things better and easier for landowners to make good choices, be informed, all of those really important components of a project. Um, so in collaboration with those county offices, with DNR and the permitting, also DNR has coastal staff who are really a wealth of information, who are in the loop on a lot of the projects and funding going on, um, can assist us with direction on what gaps are there and what resources we have that we might not have thought of. Um, RDC is Arrowhead Regional Development Commission. They've also participated with some of the funding and project ideas, and I'll get into some of that later on in another slide, but them too um, wanna help and fill those gaps with collecting data, sharing information, being at the table. And they're also part of the North Shore Management Board. Um, that board is a joint powers board um, that develop, discuss, and evaluate shoreline management along the North Shore. Um, the significant cities within this area are covered townships, the county, the soil water, and Grand Portage Band of Chippewa is at the table in that management board. And they developed a technical advisory team committee that has um, different players and um, participants, such as Lana and myself, Grand Portage, RDC, um, people who are hands on to gather information and share with the North Shore Management Board on what we know and what we feel is important to gather. Also consistent messaging be between agencies and counties is important as I mentioned before. Um, sometimes there may be a gap of knowing what the county does or what our soil water conservation districts can contribute. And so just getting everyone at the table, talking about what we all do, how we work and what we can share and learn from each other also development of sharing of materials instead of everyone doing their own thing, um, just not reinventing the wheel, having good material on the out slot and then sharing from there. Um, also discussions, just checking in, you know, we have quarterly meetings, we have monthly meetings, depending on what project we have going on and just keeping the ball rolling on those. Um, the agreements, as Alina said, the One Watershed, One Plan has a policy committee that makes the decisions on the funding and that once again is um, partners within the county and the soil water conservation districts. Um, through getting that implementation funding, we have an application process. Those partners can list out what are important projects they wanna see funding. The policy committee meets, reviews it, discusses it. Um, we present on those and then those are ranked. 
Um, and then once those agreements are formed, we have joint powers agreements that list responsibilities. So we're not overstepping, we're not, um, we have clear lines drawn to see who is responsible for what. Next slide. Next slide, Elena. I'm trying. It's oh, sorry. <laughs> I was sorry. like, maybe I'm supposed to do this. No, it's not going. It's frozen. I'm sorry. It <laughs> should be soon here. <laughs> okay. Um, I can just move on to the next one. Okay. Land order relationships, as I mentioned, the soil water conservation districts really has a mission of working and being a resource for landowners and people who are making decisions on their properties. Um, we want to have a lot of resource and guidance available to them, and that can be in many forms. Um, we can have you know, recorded presentations, we can send out newsletters, you know, the sky's the limit. And I think it's really important to tap into a lot of different diverse ways of communication so that no one is left behind. Um, for instance, our office is gonna do a newsletter that we send out to every person in the county. We thought about putting little attachments within the newspaper, we write articles, um, we have things on the radio. And so it's just really important to, build a bridge um, and let people know that we're available. Um, accommodating and convenience, when we develop presentations, we really cater around when people are available and when we can get the most um, people at the table. Follow through is important as we all know, returning phone calls, following up with email, just being present and available. Um, that trust is built through time. And so, like I mentioned before, just having a different avenues of getting the information out, open door policy of stop by and we can talk. We have pamphlets to share um, and also neighbor word of mouth. I mean, if we have a successful project, neighbors wanna know, well, what did you do? Who did you talk to? What kind of things are available for me to know? Um, and all of those really important things help. Next slide. Coastal erosion on Lake Superior, how this fits into everything. Um, as I mentioned, the One Watershed, One Plan implementation funding had multiple projects that we were able to fund with that. Um, the county, for instance, has permitting, as I mentioned. Um, through that process, they determined that our office, the SWCD, being the resource and non-regulatory, could assist with planting plans along the shore. And so now, as a condition of those variance requests and projects being approved, that they work with us to do a planting plan, do site visits and guidance. Um, and that really builds the success of a project and leaves you know, a lot of power within the landowner's hand where they can reach out to us and we can collaborate with them and they can know what decisions they can make versus just, you know, I need to do a permit and follow X, Y, Z. Um, we hope to make it more hands-on and approachable. Next project or next slide. Um, this is a really great grant that we received from the coastal program. Um, the focus was to look at the intense development along the shore try to sway people towards considering green infrastructure, whether it's native plants, geotextiles, coir logs, and less of that um, hard armoring, whether it's riprap or seawalls. And so we had a clever um, postcard that we sent out to people along the shore. We did a listserv of that. And this was another great collaboration project between our offices at Cook and Lake and the counties. Um, we had more than 100 landowners service through this, and there was a wealth of information. And once again, the resources that we had were diverse. We recorded the content so people wouldn't be left out. They could see it at any time. Um, I can put that link in the chat at the end of the presentation. We have some really good handouts that we were able to collaborate with Melanie Perello from um, the Coastal Program and just a wealth of information through that. And then if people attended those workshops, there were more than 30 site visits that we were able to assist with. We had a coastal engineer that we hired and they assisted with the site visits and just talked one-on-one -on -one with landowners on what their resource concerns are and how we can help and what recommendations. Understanding that sometimes that hard armoring might be um, important or necessary, but also how we can incorporate green infrastructure into those projects or maybe even cover the entire thing with that rather than just going to 
you know, concrete and rock. Um, so we had realtors attend, contractors, like I mentioned, landowners, and then we had one for agency partners. So we made sure that we covered all of our basis on getting everyone up to speed and on the same page. Next slide. Um, so once again, just important of partnerships, we need to communicate more, um, having mutual goals, talking about what is necessary for each of the agencies and how we can build on that and where we can fill those gaps with our expertise, um, building on each other's strengths. For instance, Elena is a big planner. I'm more of a work under pressure person, but that's good because then Elena works on the front end. I fill in at the end and then, you know, it comes together. And so I also told her, I'll meet you in the middle and I'll try to be less of a cruncher, but we all have our strengths. You know, in my office, we have um, numerous staff that have really good, you know, things that they can do. And so we all share the load and just volunteer depending on what we're good at and what we can do. Um, consistent messaging, as I mentioned, is really important. Having documents that we can all share rather than having multiple conflicting information is really helpful for landowners and for ourselves. And just checking in frequently and having that one watershed one plan um, to kind of direct our thoughts and our goals and our missions through that process. Next slide. Um, just stressing once again that landowners, they're the ones making the decisions and having that really good relationship with them and giving them knowledge to chew on, you know, information to think about um, the cost benefit analysis, you know, pamphlets that we've developed, um, advertising things, workshops, information that we're here to assist. Um, that takes time. Also photographs to show the story that relates to people. Um, just showing them, you know, this is what it looks like and also having those success stories of, you know, this is before and after, this is what, you know, we could assist with and just going from there. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, RDC has been involved, you know, Justin Otzi and Charlie Moore from RDC developed this coastal erosion mapping tool. It's really great. Um, there was multiple phases of this project. Um, this assists assisted with decision making for coastal property owners regarding concerns and hazard erosion areas. Um, they had erosion data layers, methodology, story maps, they have presentations on their website. I can share the link for them as well. Um, but the tool is on this website and the wealth of information is immense and um, partners, just an instance of getting one, everyone up to speed. They were doing this project and some of us were less technically inclined. And so we were confused, you know, how does this work? And so just taking the time for RDC um, took the time to train us all and show us a hands-on demonstration of how it works. And we realized how immensely important this tool was and it was really good for us to use moving forward. Next slide. Um, so once again, listen to your partners, work together, listen to the landowners, um, build on each other's strengths. Um, also, the plan really gives us a mutual understanding of our resource management across the pol political boundaries. Um, the decisions are made on a unified scale. Um, it's just a great way to work and collaborate together. Um, being a perfectionist myself, I realized that I may not have all the answers and I may not know everything, but I know where to find it. So that's super important um, and just have fun. So I think that's it, unless you want to add anything. Um, two of the people in my office are here who work really well on these projects too, Emily Nelson and Derek Passy. Um, I don't know if they have anything to add, but we can move to questions. Thank you so much, Tara and Elena. Uh, we really appreciate you both being here and speaking um, and, and telling us about the important work that you're doing. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to kind of urge audience members to reach out to the both of you via email um, if they have any questions, um, because we, we kind of need to move on to our next presentation. If there are questions in the chat and you are sticking around, uh, Tara, if, if you would like to respond to those in the chat, you are more than welcome. But I'm going to go ahead and transition over to our next presentation just to give them enough time to, to say what they need to say. So we're gonna hear from a couple of speakers from the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. 
We're going to hear from Tori Graves and Bridget Brown. Tori joined the city initiative last May as a U.S. policy advisor, where her work focuses on managing multiple facets of the organization's coastal resilience program, including the Mayor's Advisory Council on Coastal Resilience and pilot program for the Resilient Coastal Projects Initiative. And then we're also going to hear from Bridget. Bridget Brown joined the city's initiative as special programs director on March 1st. Her academic background is in environmental science and policy with a focus on water. She's worked in a wide variety of settings, including community-based outreach, higher education, and international policy. She is based in Milwaukee. So Bridget and Tori, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Sarah. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, looks great. And you, I can hear you Perfect. loud and clear. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having us out today. It's an exciting moment just to get people together in a room, kind of hear what people are up to. So it's nice to be a part of that. Um, I'm, as Sarah said, Tori Graves, and just started with the Cities Initiative. Some of you may have seen my name on emails, but I might be a new face to some of you. So it's good to meet everyone. And then I'm also joined today by my colleagues, um, Matt Doss, who's our US Policy Director, and as Sarah said, Bridget Brown. Um, our newest team member is the special programs director. So just wanted to shout out to them who are listening in on the call. And then today we'll be talking specifically about some of the work that we've been pushing for to advance coastal resilience in the basin, and particularly want to focus in on some of our work to support Wisconsin's coastal communities. So more, a little bit more relevant to kind of what you all are advancing. So before we jump in, I want to quickly review who we are as an organization in case you all are unfamiliar. Uh, the city's initiative was formed in 2003 by the former mayors of Chicago and Toronto, and the organization has grown significantly over the years to become a binational coalition of more than um, 135 mayors. And I think my number was incorrect on the first slide I set, but we're uh, nearing 135 mayors now across the US and Canada. And you'll see a lot of them on the map here, but we still have to update that with some uh, newer members that we've gained in recent years. As an organization, we aim to advance the protection and restoration of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River, primarily by convening local governments, specifically through mayors. So we are all about mayors here, and um, they make up our membership. And really, our goal is to elevate this local perspective up the chain to a binational level. Over the years, we've covered a lot of major issues pertaining to the Great Lakes. A lot of your big ticket items like ecological restoration, invasive species and water withdrawals. But a big part of our work, and as you all kind of know, working in the Great Lakes field, we have to be nimble and able to adjust to the most pressing issues facing communities. And as such, our focus in recent years has shifted to cover COVID relief, water equity, um, water infrastructure funding and coastal resilience, which I'll of course be talking about more today. So as many of you are aware, Coastal hazards, particularly flooding and erosion, have placed a heavy burden on coastal communities across the basin in recent years. And our goal as an organization is to help support um, specifically municipalities, again, thinking about our mayors and cities surrounding the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River, and focusing on how can we help municipalities in their endeavors to become more resilient to coastal variability over the long term including associated impacts from climate change. So I know I don't have anything on my slide yet, but I'm gonna kind of pop up a little series here. So over the last um, year or so, we've really been building out a comprehensive coastal resilience program to address a number of priority areas. And the first here is that we're dedicated to utilizing science and research as a foundation for our work. And one way that we've contributed to this uh, in recent years is by conducting a coastal resilience needs assessment survey. So this happened last spring in partnership with the University of Illinois. And we hope to begin conducting this annually, which will really help us to start track trends and emerging challenges across the basin's coastal municipalities. Then building on research, we've also been developing a broader coastal strategy through our Mayor's Advisory Council on Coastal Resilience. Uh, so we always shorten this to Advisory Council just to make things easier. But this group is, is led by member mayors and supported by regional coastal partners who over the past year have been developing a suite of recommendations for improving municipal coastal resilience across the basin. And over the next year, the group will begin taking steps 
to spur action around these recommendations that we just outlined. So a really exciting time for that group. Um, and we'll, you know, certainly be looking forward to what comes out of that effort. Then finally pairing our research and strategy, we have a few areas where we're uh, trying to influence coastal resilience more on the ground. So really thinking about kind of projects and relationship building and things like that. So first we remain active in advocating for policies that facilitate greater coastal resilience and expand uh, federal resources and support for local communities. Then we've also been engaging with groups um, like CALM and CHAOS and all of these disparate groups across the basin that are doing similar work just to stay in touch on what people are doing. And in tandem with this, we're also hosting uh, you know, different educational webinars and things geared towards information and education based, um, again, geared towards mayors and municipalities. And then finally, we've been working with local communities to boost development and implementation of coastal resilience projects. And we're branding this through our Resilient Coastal Projects Initiative. So some of you may have heard some of this through our regional coastal resilience work groups. These are all kind of within the same boat. So we have this broader program focused on projects and we have work groups across the basin. And this is really going to be the focus of the remainder of the presentation. Um, and so that's kind of where we'll be focusing today. So for more on the Resilient Coastal Project, Projects Initiative, um, the initiative is focused on working with municipalities to identify coastal projects and then develop plans for getting those projects funded and implemented. The initiative started last year when we received grants from the Fund for Lake Michigan to work with Wisconsin's Lake Michigan communities and a separate grant from Herb Foundation to work with communities in Southeast Michigan. And then we were able to leverage these funds to receive a larger grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation late last year to expand this work across the basin. So now with, with sort of this um, large support behind us that we're really fortunate to have, we're now kind of pushing this forward as a broader program basin wide. Um, and we'll be implementing this broader effort in the coming months and, and years. So you'll be hearing more about this. Um, and importantly, that expansion will include uh, Wisconsin coastal communities along Lake Superior as well. So currently we're doing sort of a pilot um, in Wisconsin's Lake Michigan community. So I'm gonna share a little bit more about that and you can kind of see what this might look like in your area over the coming year, it's somewhat similar. And I also wanna recognize Stantec, who's been a primary technical consultant and partner on this work so far as well. So thinking about our pilot program, again, kind of visualizing what this might look like in your area when, when the time comes, the program is broken down into multiple phases. So the first, first and foremost, the first thing we wanna do is prioritize relationship building and make sure that we have the right people at the table. So in our pilot programs, we've organized advisory teams in each re region to serve as a sounding board and provide local and sub-regional context to the project. This step is really critical since we're working at such a large scale and we really wanna make sure that we're still staying grounded in local perspectives and working with people that are experiencing these challenges on a regular basis. We've also worked with the advisory team to identify communities that were invited to participate in the program. So while we'd love to help as many cities as we can, obviously we have kind of limits to that. So we've leveraged the advisory team as a way to kind of, as a sounding board for that process. Um, and then when we invited communities, we focused on invitations to both the mayors and the staff from these municipalities, because we know that this work couldn't be done with just staff or just mayors. So really bringing together the full um, municipal team to get these projects um, energized and, and move them forward. Once we establish those working relationships, uh, we've in our pilot programs, we've been working more one on one then. So we kind of transitioned from a lar larger kickoff to then working more individually with the communities uh, and beginning to identify a sort of laundry list. So our initial process is really just catch all, identify everything out there that could be approached in terms of coastal resilience. And then um, after that, we kind of go through an evaluation process, working with our technical partners to review priority areas based on different coastal data sets available. And then we'll also think through other project feasibility parameters as well. And then ultimately this will kind of help us narrow in on 
a shorter list of projects, which again, working very closely with the, the municipalities to kind of have this, this feedback loop of analyzing projects, getting feedback from the cities, and, and then ultimately working together to select one project for each participating community. And then for the remainder of the project, consultants will work to develop what we're calling implementation frameworks. And basically these are a roadmap for outlining uh, aspects that will need to be considered in order for the projects to get funded and implemented. And there'll be a heavy focus on identifying um, a couple of funding sources that could be targeted through that, that framework. So in the end, again, identifying projects, working with communities to create these frameworks, then also ultimately cities can take this product and begin taking steps to pursue funding once we've kind of wrapped up our, our cycle there. So while our work focuses on coastal projects for this initiative, we've remained a little flexible on different types of work that could fall into this. We've had a lot of questions about, you know, does it have to be directly onshore or can it be more coastal zone? And we've decided to take the approach of, of keeping it a little more flexible within that coastal zone um, while prioritizing nature-based solutions that really consider the long-term impacts uh, from climate change as well. So overall resilience. And these projects could include things that address issues like shoreline stabilization and erosion, flooding, stormwater management, um, water infrastructure, critical public infrastructure, habitat and natural feature restoration. I'm sure a lot of you have interacted with, with sort of all of these different types of projects in this space. And I also want to note that through our pilot program with Wisconsin's Lake Michigan communities, we've um, really seen all of these different types of projects put forward. And we've seen also a focus on um, some additional things that aren't on this list are, you know, what are impacts to recreation and tourism and waterfront revitalization. So these, there's just a, a big suite of projects that can be approached here. And we want to be mindful of the unique needs that each community has. And so this won't be a one size fits all approach, but really kind of tailored working one-on-one -on -one with communities to identify what their needs and potential solutions could be. So before I turn it over to Bridget, I want to just share some quick uh, details and early outcomes for my pilot program in Wisconsin's Lake Michigan communities. And just to, again, kind of help visualize what this could look like um, in the Lake Superior communities, although it could look a little bit different. So don't take this as at face value. Um, so in our pilot region, we're currently engaging with 12 communities to help identify and prioritize coastal resilience projects as seen on the map here. So these are the 12 communities. And then support this work. Um, to support this work, we have more than 20 local and regional coastal partners who are part of that advisory team that I've mentioned early on to help guide the processes and, and outcomes. And then we asked these communities of the 12 communities here, we asked them to propose those projects. We actually received about 60 plus different projects or sites that could be um, covered in this space. And then through further conversations, we've been able to narrow this down to about 20 and we'll continue to review these and, and ultimately select 12 projects, again, one per community. And then I also wanna note an important element around collaboration that's come out of this effort as well. And as we've been pushing forward this work, again, this is kind of a pilot. So we're learning, you know, what things are important to making this process successful and having good partnerships. We really found that it became apparent, you know, there's a lot of groups working in this space. I think that's the exciting thing about Wisconsin is there's just so many people doing really great things in the coastal space. So a really key and valuable part of our work has been to work closely with other local and sub-regional partners who are potentially doing similar work that we can align our programs, um, support as many communities as possible, and really capitalize on different opportunities that might be available to coastal communities. And um, this is something we'd like to continue replicating in all of the other regions that we'll be expanding to um, over the next year. And again, for this reason, we're excited to see groups like Calm and Chaos being formed to kind of help, help this process of let it, helping groups stay in the know of what each other's doing. Um, and how we can work together in this space. So really exciting opportunity. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Bridget, who will share some more on what's to come in the Lake Superior Basin. Um, and just wanna note that she'll be the one leading the expansion of the Resilient Coastal Projects Initiative, 
um, that will be expanding beyond our pilot communities. So that will include some Lake Superior communities as well. So you'll be hearing more from her um, after today, probably. Thanks, Tori. Um, and thanks, Sarah, for pulling this meeting together and including us. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing from everyone so far. And I'll try to be fast because I know for everyone, we're kind of at the end of the meeting and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, but I'm really, really excited to um, get launching this program um, up in the Lake Superior region. So uh, today I just want to, because we haven't started, I just want to basically provide a little bit of a timeline and next steps and talk about how you all can get involved and how we can connect. So my goal is, um, you know, sometime by the end of summer, early fall to launch this work up in your region, up on Lake Superior. Um, it really depends. We're trying to stagger several new regions at once. With the new grant, we were able to get funding to expand um, this uh, Resilient Coastal Projects Initiative into Illinois, Indiana, West Michigan, and then a few communities on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New York. So we have a lot that's going to be happening and starting kind of within a few months. So um, don't hold me to a specific timeline, but you know, sometime um, by the end of the summer, early fall. Um, to start, um, the process that Tori outlined, I'll be looking to build a small, probably not an advisory team for the region because it's a much smaller region than um, her uh, Lake Michigan coast, um, but probably an advisory network of folks who can provide a regional or landscape level perspective um, that I can consult with throughout the life of the project. Um, and at the same time, um, we'll start reaching out to the communities. Um, specifically for this region, we're going to be starting with Ashland, Bayfield, and Superior because um, we're a member-based organization and those are member cities. Also Duluth, um, for anyone who's from Minnesota on here. Um, and we want to connect with them and hear from them what they're experiencing and where their priorities are for working on coastal resilience. And then from there, we'll start to begin the project selection process that Tori outlined um, for this expansion um, under the NIFWIF grant. Um, we are really emphasizing nature-based solutions. And if possible, we would love to help coastal communities go big and really go after some large levels of federal funding that they might not have been able to access before, for example, through the infrastructure bill or the National Coastal Resilience Fund, just something that's like maybe beyond what they're typically um, able to get. Um, but that said, we're also we're really taking a community centered approach. And so we understand that, you know, something that might look great to us from like a climate data perspective, um, looking at the coastline might not necessarily align with their priorities for like social or economic benefits. And so that's why um, we really need to have both that advisory kind of like systems regional level perspective as well as that community perspective. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about how you all can get involved. Uh, so first, if you're working on a similar initiative and you think there might be overlap or opportunities for us to communicate or collaborate, let's connect, please. Um, so we don't wanna come in as outsiders and step on toes and we want the communities to benefit as much as possible. Um, and so I'll say like now and later because, you know, um, looking at that map that you pulled up for the one watershed, one plan, and like looking at Canada right there, we're eventually hoping to expand into Canada. And so I can see some really cool opportunities, gosh, for like international collaboration at some point, like just thinking really big and longer term. Um, but also Tara, you said it really well, just about collaboration and how everyone has different um, strengths. And um, it's just, I think, really great um, to collaborate and connect. So I will be reaching out to some of you and I hope um, you do the same if you think that there's some overlap or um, a, a reason to communicate. Um, secondly, I will be looking for a few people from up this way to consult with as advisors. Um, so you might hear from me, or if you think that's you, please reach out to me. My contact info is on the next slide. And then finally, if you live in Ashland, Bayfield, Superior, or Duluth, and you work at the city level, we will be forming those um, city working groups that Tori talked a little bit about. And those groups will really be like fleshing out the plan. So they'll be working closely with our technical consultants once we invite um, the project pitches when we first start. Um, so that's another way to get involved. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks for listening. Um, and I don't think we have time for questions, but maybe you can email us if you do have questions. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Bridget. And thank you, Tori. Um, really appreciate you being here today. And I'm excited to hear about these collaborations that you're talking about. So uh, yes, I, I encourage audience members, if you have questions for Tori or Bridget, reach out to them through emails that are provided in the chat. And because we're over time, I'll just send us out here. So thank you to each of each of uh, our presenters today. You all did a wonderful job and you gave us some really great um, knowledge to, to go home and think about. So. Um, and also thank you to our members for attending this meeting. Um, and we hope to see you again at our next quarterly meeting um, for, for June. So thank you everybody and have, have a great rest of your day.